Hello, everyone. I'm Roy Steinberg, the producing artistic director here at Cape May Stage, and so grateful that you could join us. You know, because of this COVID-19 pandemic, as many of you know, we've been doing these virtual readings, and we've done, we've done some new plays and favorites, and The Whipping Man by Matthew Lopez is one of the favorite plays that we've done in many seasons. In fact, it's been done, there's been over 40 productions of it, so it's not just one of our favorites, but it's been done in theaters all over the country. Uh, Matthew Lopez, such an interesting writer. This was his first breakout play. Uh, since then, he just had a, a play on Broadway called The Inheritance, which won the Olivier Award in London. He's written The Legend of George and McBride. And right now, he's writing the libretto for Some Like It Hot, a musical version of Some Like It Hot. And now, without further ado, Please enjoy The Whipping Man. The Whipping Man by Matthew Lopez. Characters, Simon, 50s, former slave in the De Leon home, Caleb, 20s, only child of the De Leon family, and John, 20s, former slave in the De Leon home. Act one, scene one, Richmond, Virginia, Thursday, April 13th, 1865, around 10 o'clock at night. The lights rise on what was once the front entrance of a grand townhome, now in ruins. Craters dot the hardwood floors. The wallpaper is stained with soot and parts of it are burned away. Most of the windows are broken. The railing of the grand staircase leans perilously down to the floor as if it would collapse with the slightest touch. The steps themselves are broken and jagged. The damage to this house suggests recent destruction rather than years of neglect. This was someone's home not too long ago, but it is now a haunted house. A violent thunderstorm rages outside, and at the crack of a thunderbolt, the front door swings open. A young man, Caleb, in a tattered Confederate captain's uniform, leans against the doorway. He is bearded, thin, and dirty. He hops on one leg the center of the room. He then slowly extends his other leg and tries to put weight on it. He lets out a cry of pain and collapses onto the floor in a dead faint. A few moments pass, and then slowly, an older man, Simon, enters from the kitchen. He's middle-aged, black, and carries a rifle with a lantern dangling from the end. It's too dark to see anything. The older man cautiously approaches. Lightning and thunder, the room fills with light for a brief moment. The older man sees the young man on the floor. Hey, you! Mm. Wake up, soldier! Wake up! Mm. Mm. Easy. Hey, you get that rifle out of my face, old man. Seeing as I'm the one holding it, I think I'll make the rule. Where am I? That don't matter, because you ain't staying. Whose home is this? You best be on your way. There ain't nothing left here to steal if that's what you're thinking. And if it's dying you're looking to do, you best do that elsewhere. Now get up. Simon? Simon, is that you? The older man brings his lantern down to the younger man's face and takes a good, long look at it. Hey, Lord. Yes. Yes. Oh, my God. Am I, am I home? Is this... Is this am, I, am I home? You are? Oh, God. Oh, God. Baruch Melachom. <sighs> Where is everyone? Where, 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 where's my mother? Where, where's Sarah? Oh, Sarah's with your pa and my Elizabeth. Your pa took them with him when he left with President Davis. My oh. girls are safe with your pa. And my mother? Oh, she went over to Wimsburg to be with your grandma. She's safe too. When will they be back? No one knows. Just like everyone else from this town, most folks are gone. They'll be back when it's safe. <sighs> No. What about... Uh, Ain't seen him in some time. Probably on a drunk somewhere. Oh, God. I bet money on a bottle before I bet on him leaving. Huh. Oh, I'm thirsty, Simon. Get me some water. Oh. Simon? Sure. Sure, I'll do that. Simon exits to the kitchen, and Caleb looks around the room. Oh, what the hell happened here? 
Caleb tries to stand. It's not easy for him. He finally gets himself upright on one leg, and he cautiously extends the other and tries to put weight on it. He collapses in a heap, crying out in pain. Simon reentered oh. with the mason jar filled with water, handing it to Caleb. That you doing all that yelling? Yeah. You wounded? God, Sister Grace, I'll be fine. Can you stand up? Yes, I can stand. Can you walk? Walking's a different matter. When this happen? Hmm. A week, maybe more. We uh, we we were leaving Petersburg, and uh... well, one of them federal doctors didn't tend to it. What federal doctors? When you surrendered. Oh no, no, they uh, they're more concerned with their own, I guess. Well, we best take a look at it. No, it's not that bad. Weak old wounds have a habit of killing people. Might have to take you up to the soldiers' hospital. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not going there. I'm not. I'm not going anywhere. I just got here. I'm not leaving. Simon begins lighting a few candles and lamps around the room. Not too many. They throw off just a weak light. What happened to this house, Simon? Same thing happened to all the other houses. What? What about the furniture? Stolen. By who? People. By <laughs> happened to this house too. Upstairs, well, I don't go upstairs no more. Why not? Big holes in the roof. Rain's coming in. Artillery shells took a lot out of the roof. The Yanks did that? No, you boys did that. I hear tell someone told someone else to light all the warehouses on fire so the Yanks couldn't get at any of what was in there. Cotton, tobacco, all up in the blaze. Then the fire spread to where they stored the munitions and boom, right into your mama's sewing room. Oh. <sighs> Look like this. Yeah, I saw as I rode up. Ugh. Hell happened to this town. Look like hell didn't happen to you too. Oh, what have you been doing this whole time? The well, last few months I was living up at Chimborazo with your mom and the women from the temple. Nursing, bandaging, whatever needed doing. Then when the federals came, your mom left from Williamsburg. And, and told you to come back here and, and wait for everybody. She t She asked me. Just let me take a look. Simon pulls out a pocket knife and cuts Caleb's pant leg open at the knee to reveal a rotting bullet wound. God in heaven, this ain't no graves. There's a bullet hole. You were shot a week ago and you ain't had it clean? I, it, it, it was chaos. We need to clean this. Your pa has some whiskey left. Some, he has cases. Had cases. Simon Where did the whiskey section. go? Same place it always goes when there's trouble. I hear she is. This gonna hurt now. Yeah, I'm sure I felt worse. Simon pours the whiskey on the wound. Caleb lets out a yell. God damn it, Simon, that hurts. You don't say. <sighs> What's there to eat? Not much. Been living off a sack of cornmeal and some vegetables from the garden. It's yours if you want it. But where are the chickens? Ain't no chickens. You got to understand, things been bad for a while. People, they, there ain't no food. Market still open? It's open, so to speak, those that are left to sell. But what money are you going to buy with? People only taking federal. Only the rich are eating. But aren't we rich? That's for your father to say. All I know is when he left, he didn't leave nothing behind to live off of. I come home, everyone's gone, larder's empty, chicken's dead. Carrots, collards, cornmeal. That's what we got. I'll eat anything. Well, that being the case, you say you rode here? I had a horse. Had? He's dead out front. Just well can't feed a horse anyway. Could eat one, though. That horse have any meat on him? Not much. He spent a week dying. Well, whatever's left, he ain't got no more need for it. And God knows we could use a meal. Yes. I got rags in the kitchen. I need to clean this room. Yeah. Caleb reaches into his coat pocket, pulls out a, po a packet of letters, tied together with a string. The sight of them moves him greatly. <sighs> Just then a figure is seen moving around out on the front porch, looking through the windows. Who's that? Who is that? The figure moves away. Simon! Simon, get in here! Simon re-enters. What? What is it? 
<laughs> Something, something's moving out there, uh, looking in the windows. Simon grabs the rifle and moves to the front door. He opens the door and looks around, but no one's there. Comes back into the house. No one there. There was someone looking through the window. Well, if they take a look again, you would be down the barrel of this gun. Simon continues to look out the window for a moment and then turns to face Caleb. You ain't gonna like what I'm about to say. Well, don't tell me we're out of whiskey, too. <laughs> Your leg, uh... You got the gang green pretty bad. How bad? Well, it ain't gone above your knee, which is good, but that leg gonna have to come off. No. Caleb. No. I spent three months looking at sick legs. I, I said no. Caleb. I've been inside plenty of hospital tents these last four years. I saw what it was like when they took off those limbs. I do not want to do that. You, you ever see what happens when they don't? We don't cut your leg off at the knee. The gangrene gonna keep crawling right on up, hurting every inch as it goes. It's gonna pass through your private. They're gonna fall off like ripe apples on a tree. They're gonna be a big hole where your Tommy Johnson used to be. It's gonna eat away at your liver, your stomach, your kidneys. It's gonna crawl right up to your heart and turn it black, blacker than my fists. Your blood gonna be so filled with poison, every part of you is gonna hurt. You're going to be in more pain than you ever thought you could stand. You're going to lose your mind with the pain. And then, and only then, will you die. The pain you're going to feel having this leg come off today is going to feel like a tickle compared to the pain you're going to feel when you die of poison blood on Sunday. You understand me? If I do this, I'm going to be better. You're going to have a chance of being better. I wouldn't be saying this if I didn't believe it. Do you trust me? Good. Now I need to clean this wound, then find some help in the morning to take you up to Chimborazo. Wait, no, 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 the hospital. Um, uh, do it here. I can't do If you think this is something I need, you're gonna do it. I can't. Yes, you can. You've done it before, haven't you? Oh, not by myself. I could kill you. So could they. And I would rather die here than at a hospital. I can't do it. You will. How much whiskey we got left? Uh, you got tools? Well, well I, I, I... How much whiskey we got left? Well, well, not enough to keep the wound clean and get you as drunk as you're gonna need to be. Well, how drunk? Dead drunk. Even that ain't gonna be enough. All right, we'll make do with what we got then. You go look for more whiskey, find what you can, uh, uh, check the cellar. Hey, look. What? All these things you telling me to do? By right now, you need to be asking me to do. But well, are you asking me to chop my leg off, or are you telling me? I'm telling you. Then I am telling you to go get the fucking whiskey. If you're giving orders, I'm giving orders. Does that sound fair to you? Fair enough for now. Simon exits. The figure appears again at the window. Who's here? Huh? Who is that? The figure moves to the door. Who are you? The front door slowly opens. We see the figure standing in the shadows. He wears a burlap hood over his face with two eye holes cut out, putting him in the likeness of an executioner. He exudes menace. Captain Caleb DeLeon? Who is that? Mm -hmm. Are you Captain Caleb DeLeon? Who are you? I am the man asking if you are Captain Caleb DeLeon. What do you want? I have a message for you. From who? What is the message? A moment, then the man rips the hood off to reveal the face of John. <laughs> oh! Oh! Nigga, John has come home! Oh. John's clothes are dirty and tattered. His feet are bare, his hair has grown out, and a week's worth of beard sits on his face. He also has a cloth bandage wrapped around one hand. God damn it, John, you scared me half to death. Yeah, you look at least to be three quarters of the way there. Yeah. Is your dead horse here? Yeah, it is. I don't know which of the two of you look worse. Did you creeping around just then? I saw a soldier crawling up the house and thought he might be up to no good. I thought you were a looter. 
Oh, I was having the same thoughts about you. Oh, good to know the house is well protected. Well, not that there's much to protect. They're just you and Simon then? Yeah, that's right. No one else. You. <laughs> you wounded? That's just a scratch. Uh, where you been? Simon says you've been missing. I haven't missed a thing. You been here in Richmond? I have. What's your news? Have you, uh, you heard anything? I heard everything. What do you want to know? Um, war's over. We lost. You lost. We won. <laughs> whiskey? What? You want some whiskey? He produces a bottle of whiskey from his pocket. Now, where in the hell did you get that? A neighbor. Hey, you stole it. I did not steal anything. Stealing is when somebody has gone to great lengths to protect something. That was not the case with this. Although there was a case of this. <laughs> oh, look, the house was half burned and the doors were wide open. No, this whiskey was liberated and has now been occupied by me. You want some? You were at Petersburg, weren't you? I was. What did they say? I wouldn't have wanted to be there. <laughs> no, you wouldn't have. So I guess you surrendered with Lee at Appomattox. <laughs> I did. <laughs> that must have stung. <laughs> Um, what do I call you now? Call me? Master doesn't quite fit no more. You never called me that. Sir, do, do I call you sir now? <laughs> you never called me that either. I think Caleb will be just fine. Who will he? Simon enters, carrying a toolbox and a bottle of whiskey. Well, look who won't. Simon? Where you been, boy? Here, yeah, there, mostly there. Oof, this place sure got picked over. You have anything to do with it? I wish I had. I come home thinking you'd be here, and you just up and disappeared. Well, now I just up and reappeared. What'd you do to your hand? <laughs> it's nothing. Let me take a look at it. No, it's nothing. <laughs> What's wrong with Caleb? Simon he got a bullet in, in his leg. Shot from Caleb. He got a bullet in his leg. What? He said it wasn't bad. He ain't a doctor. Well, neither are you. Closest thing he got to one, his leg gonna have to come off. But does he know that? He ain't got no choice. I've been trying to get him to go to the hospital, but he won't budge. So, uh, well, I told him to do it here, but that's too much for one man, especially in the dark. I figured if I start laying out all my tools, it might scare him into going to the hospital. If that don't work, I just figured to get him drunk. He's half starved as it is. It won't take much for him to pass out. Then we take him to the hospital whether he wants to go or not. Wait, we? Oh, no, 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 no. I need your help, John. You gonna take him up to Chimborazo. Mm -mm. It needs doing. Uh, let me ask you something. How is this our problem anymore? Our problem? That boy's dying, laying in his mama's house dying. That's a problem. So let's leave. Let's get out of here. But when they find out, we'll be long gone. And then what would happen to Caleb? You see anybody else around here? I need your help, John. All right, could we do it here? If I helped, could you, could we do it? Could do, but that ain't an easy thing. He gonna be kicking and screaming. You think you're strong enough to hold him down? I have been since we were kids. Could be done then. All right, so how do we do this? Uh, just chop it off with an axe or something? An axe? You crazy boy? Well, I don't know. I've never taken off someone's leg before. We use a saw. Saw at his leg right above the knee. Here, see? He points to a spot on John's leg. He continues to explain using John's leg as an example. We got to cut through the skin, through the muscle, right down to the bone. And then? Then clear through the bone as fast as we can. He gonna be wiggling and struggling. The more he struggles, the harder it's gonna be for me to cut. 
John grabs the whiskey from Simon and takes a huge gulp. Mm. On to the other side of the leg, the muscle, the skin, till they come right off. Well, that's it then. That's just the beginning. He got an artery there in his leg. Got to tie that off or else he's going to bleed to death. As it is, he's going to be bleeding all over himself and us too. You know how to tie it off? Done it hundreds of times. Then we take the skin from the leg and we cut it. We pull it back, like pulling the husk off a of corn, see? We cut away at the muscle on the leg to the bone sticking out. We wrap the skin around the bone. We fold them one over the other and sew it up. That makes the stump, see? He's awake during all this? Without ether? All depends on his strength. Some men pass out at the side of the saw, others watch the whole thing. What about the person holding him down? When does he usually pass out? I need you strong, John. I, I, I can do this. Ain't gonna be pretty. We gonna be up all night. Then, let's get started. Want a drink first? No. Yes, yeah, suit yourself. John goes to take a swig and Simon grabs the bottle out of his hands on his way over to Caleb. All right now, Caleb. We gonna do things your way. We won't take you to the hospital, but we got to do this now. Keep drinking. Oh, God damn it, Simon, I'm already drunk. Get drunk or go on, big old gulps. Oh, Simon, I don't, I don't... I had this moon clean days ago. Should have had that leg off by now. Hey, Simon, I changed my mind. You want to go to the hospital? What? No. When you ain't got no mind to change. <sighs> start drinking that whiskey, your bottle is for your belly. My bottle is for your leg. If I finish my bottle before you finish yours, you're going to be in the world of hurt. John, get the chair. Keep drinking. Oh, God. Stop it, stop it. I think we're going to be sick. We're going to be a lot sicker if we don't get this leg off. Oh, stop it. Keep drinking. I'm going to grab your leg now. Simon grabs Caleb by his leg and John takes him by the shoulders. They move him over to the chair and rest his leg on it. Simon rips Caleb's pant leg open to above the knee. Caleb's leg is rotting. <gasps> tourniquet! Simon points to a tourniquet in the toolbox. John grabs it and hands it to Simon who ties it around Caleb's thigh. Simon, 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 I, I don't want you to do this. Got no choice, Caleb. No, I don't want you to. You gonna die if we don't. I'll take my chances. You'll be dead by Sunday. Simon, I can't, I can't do this. You ain't got to do nothing. I'm going to do all the work. Simon, don't do this! Simon takes the bottle and pours the whiskey over the wound. Caleb screams and tries to get away, but Simon stops him. John, you got to hold him down now. Hold him down. John pins Caleb to the floor. Let go of me, God damn it! Simon repositions Caleb's leg on the chair, and Caleb struggles against John. I said let go! Hold him down, John! He's not going anywhere! Caleb continues to struggle, but is just too drunk and weak to get John off of him. Simon takes a saw from the toolbox. Caleb sees it and starts to scramble away. No! John struggles to keep Caleb pinned. Simon steps on the foot of Caleb's good leg, bearing down with all his weight to keep him from kicking. He then repositions Caleb's bad leg onto the chair. Simon, no, no, please, Simon, Simon, don't do this. I got no choice, Caleb. Simon, please, please don't do this. It needs doing, Caleb. Please don't do this. 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 Simon breaks off a spindle from the chair and hands it to John. For his mouth to bite down on. John takes the spindle and tries to put it in Caleb's mouth, but Caleb spits it out. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't you fucking do this. Don't you fucking do this. Don't you fucking do this. John grabs the spindle again and forcefully puts it into Caleb's mouth, holding it in place. Caleb screams and struggles, his words muffled by the spindle, and then... Simon pulls the saw back, making the first cut into Caleb's leg. The lights immediately fade on them and slowly rise on the rest of the house. It's our first full look at the ruin. Caleb screams. It's as if his screams were pushing the light upward. His screams echo throughout the empty house as the lights finally fade completely. Scene 2. The next morning, April 14th, 1865. Caleb is sleeping on a mattress on the floor. His leg is gone, and he's covered in quilts and blankets. A few sacks filled with pilfered goods lay around the room. Stacks of books are scattered around as well. Simon kneels on the floor with a bucket and a scrub brush, cleaning the blood stains. A cup of what we take to be coffee sits steaming by his side. John enters from upstairs, carrying a sack. He's dressed in better clothes than in scene one. He trudges down and sits on the floor of the stairs, watching Simon scrubbing. Uh... 
That coffee? Water. Ain't no coffee. You're just drinking hot water. It warms me. Would you rather have coffee? I'd rather have flapjacks and some eggs. Some toast, maybe, with some jam. I'd rather have some Elizabeth country fried chicken with a thick white gravy she wanted. And while you're at it, I'd rather have a soft feather bed to lay down in and have the first decent night's sleep I've had in years. And when I've had all that, then yes, I wouldn't mind a nice cup of hot coffee. He goes back to scrubbing. John produces a small sack of coffee and tosses it over to Simon. Simon opens it and smells deeply. Where'd you get this? Found it. Stole it. Found it. Stole it. What's the difference? I mean, of course, if you have an objection, I can always, uh... He reaches for the coffee, but Simon moves away from him. Uh, I guess you wouldn't be interested in, uh, these either. He pulls a handful you... of eggs from his coat pocket. You found those, too? Mm-mm. These I uh, discovered. You best be careful you don't discover yourself staring down the business end of a shotgun. All these houses are deserted. <laughs> this one ain't. Most of them are. It's like they unlocked the doors of a store and said, welcome. <laughs> yeah, well, folks be coming back to these houses eventually. A couple of eggs ain't nobody gonna miss, but them duds you got on. Hey, you survive your way, I'll survive mine. He reaches into his sack and pulls out a bottle of whiskey. Boy, it ain't barely even noon. Oh, I know. Mm. I do believe I'm behind schedule. <laughs> How's uh, Prince Caleb? He been running a fever this morning. I'm hoping he'll break soon. He lost a lot of blood. I don't want to see anything like that ever again. You'll be a lucky man if you don't. We need to keep an eye on him for the next few days. You best save some of that whiskey for him once he wakes up. Don't worry about the whiskey. I guarantee we both run out. What you got planned for yourself, John? Me? Well... <laughs> I figured I'll probably finish this bottle, or maybe start a new book. Mm. Oh, looking forward to dinner. I mean, with your life. Oh, <laughs> Mr. De Leon ever talk to you about money? <laughs> Mr. De Leon never talked to me about anything. Before the war, he told me he was going to give us money if we were freed. Bullshit. He said. He never told me. He only told me once. Well, maybe he was drunk. He was sober as a glass of water. How much? Enough. When? When he get back, like he done with Bad Eye, remember? No. Bad Eye bought himself free, and Mr. Deleon bought his train ticket up north. Gave him some pocket money to get started. Bad Eye went to New York City with Mr. Deleon's help. That's what you're doing here. That's not waiting for my Elizabeth and my Sarah to come home. Um, how do you know he'll keep his word? I don't. If he doesn't, we're no worse off than we are now. Which isn't saying much. So that's why you're so keen to keeping old Caleb here. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. But if Mr. DeLeon comes home to find his son dead and we could have helped him... Oh, no money. That'll be the least of our troubles. You didn't happen to discover a frying pan, did you? I'll keep an eye out for one. You best be careful. You don't have to worry about me. Simon trudges off to the kitchen. John stands looking at Caleb. Scene three. Evening, Friday, April 14th, 1865. Although there are candles and lanterns set around the front parlor, none are lit. Caleb is still asleep. Elsewhere in the house, the evidence of John's looting is even more apparent. There are some chairs, all, mis all mismatched. There are small pieces of furniture, mounds of clothing, the saddle from Caleb's horse, other things that might have been taken from neighboring houses. 
It's as if John were trying to repopulate the furnishings of this house piece by mismatched piece. The room is still more empty than full, but there is an obvious feeling of addition. John enters from the front door wearing his hood again and carrying a burlap sack. His clothes are even nicer than before. He's cleaned himself up and he cautiously looks about then slips into the house. He makes one more look outside through the window, then removes the hood. He moves over to where Caleb is sleeping and gets close to Caleb's face, staring at him. He notices the letters in Caleb's pocket and slowly reaches for them. Suddenly, Caleb wakes with a violent start and instinctively grabs John by the neck. It is the reaction of a man who still thinks he's at war. John drops the sack, a cacophony of clanging utensils and metal. John fights him off, but not without a struggle. He beats a hasty retreat away from Caleb. Who are you? It's me, nigga John! Nick, I'm, I'm, where? I'm, I'm, oh, 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 my leg, my, oh God, my leg, my, my leg is gone. It is. My leg is gone. Oh. Now. He starts to calm down. John hands him a whiskey bottle and then carefully moves about the room, lighting candles and lanterns. Oh, God. How long was that up? Oh. A little more than a day. I was back at the war. When? Just now. I jumped to Petersburg. I thought I was back, but I'm not. I'm here. Come home. Have they come back yet? Who? Uh, Elizabeth and Sarah, my folks. No, no, no one's come back here. Just, just the three of us still. And no one's been here. Are you expecting company? No one's no. been here. How'd you get that wound again? In Petersburg. Huh. Honey, you didn't get it looked at when you could have. No, it was, it was chaos. <laughs> I have no doubt, but still. What? No, it's just a uh, bunny. That's all. What? What is all this? Things. Hoes. <laughs> Mine now. What are you going to do with it? Own it. Why? Because I can. What are you going to do when the folks who used to own it come looking for it? I'll be long gone by then. <laughs> Where? I'm glad you asked. Um, you remember um, Bad Eye? Bad Eye? Bad Eye! He was about uh, um, 10 years older than us. He had that one eye that didn't work so well. Kind of rolled around in a socket. He scared the hell out of you. I know, he never scared me. Oh, so you do remember him then? We called him Lawrence. Yeah, well, we called him Bad Eye. When he left, he told me he was heading up to New York with money in his pockets and a train ticket bought by your father. So the day he left, Bad Eye pulls me aside and says to me, Nigga John. Hey, he I'm never called you that. Oh, he did. Your nickname caught on fast. Nigga John, he says. You come up to New York when you get free from here. You come up to New York City, and I'll get you set up with a job, and a bed, and a way to start your life. All right, that's what you're going to do. That is what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> what, that's funny to you? Yeah, you know how far New York is? Yeah, I know how far. You're just going to head on up to New York, out of this town. Hell out of this town. And when you get there, how do you plan on finding him? I'll find him. Oh, what, you're just going to stand on every street corner in New York City yelling out, Bad Eye! Bad Eye, where are you? If that's what it takes. Ten years after you left, here I am, Bad Eye. All right, all right. After four years of war, here yeah. I am. It's the toughest thing I ever heard. I said enough. You think my father's gonna give you money? He told me he would. When? Several times. Told me. Told Simon. Yeah, he's just gonna give you money. 
as it says in the Torah, when you set him free, do not let him go empty handed. Yeah, well, you better hope he's got some federal dollars to put in your hand. I ain't worried about that. Hey, Simon, when's dinner gonna be ready? You keep asking like that, the answer gonna be never. <laughs> <clears throat> Caleb's awake. I don't know. Simon enters from the kitchen, from the kitchen, and stops to look at him. Well, you slept a good long time. How you feel? Like hell. <laughs> that sounds about on schedule. You're gonna be in pain for a while. Gonna try to keep you in as much whiskey as we can. That'll keep any infection from setting in. How's drinking whiskey gonna keep an infection away? <laughs> whiskey kill anything. Killed your uncle Charlie. Oh. You think you can eat? I butchered that horse last night. Meat's tough, but there's a lot of it. Horse meat isn't kosher, Simon. Neither is stealing from your neighbor. You go find me a rabbi and we'll ask him which is worse. Mm. No, ain't you? Yeah. And it's as kosher as it gonna get for now. Simon heads back to the kitchen and stops and pulls John aside. Pretty cold came round today while you were sleeping off your drunk. Oh yeah? What did he want? He wanted you. Say, so he's been looking for you about a week now. <laughs> well, um, what, what did you tell him? Something told me I shouldn't tell him anything. Why do you think I got that feeling? I don't think anybody wants Freddie Cole knowing where he is. <laughs> he wasn't looking for me, John. You do something to make Freddie Cole angry. Hey, it doesn't take much. John? Tell Freddie Cole next time he comes around here looking for me that you ain't seen me. You tell him I'm long gone, ain't never coming back. You tell him, nigga John says, let bygones be bygones and a kiss my emancipated ass. He heads up the stairs and off. Simon calls after him. You done something against Freddy Cole, you gotta make it right, boy. You can't run for him forever. You living in this world now, not just serving in it. Simon exits to the kitchen as John re-enters with a fresh bottle of whiskey. Oof. Freddie Cole is not the kind of man you want to be pissing off. I ain't scared of Freddie Cole. And why are you hiding from him? What, your own money? Did you, uh, fuck his woman? He's just a mean old cracker who got it out for me, is all. He had one since the day you saw me. Yeah, well, you ain't exactly the ingratiating type. Simon re-enters with the cooked horse meat. Eat it if you're hungry, skip it if you ain't. John moves to his sack, pulls out knives and forks, and then three dinner plates. Boy, you stole all that? No one else is gonna be eating off of it. That's Miss Taylor's fine china. That's Miss Taylor's chipped china, which was lying on Miss Taylor's dirty floor. I mean, you wanna eat with your hands, be my guest, but I'm using these utensils. Simon reluctantly reaches for them. John hands them over and Simon begins serving. Never eaten horse before. <laughs> Ain't nothing to it. Like any other meat. You're hungry, right? Yeah. Well then. Simon hands John a plate full of horse meat. John sits down with it as they all prepare to eat. Bot shalom, Simon. Is it the Sabbath? Uh, it is uh, April 14th, to be precise. <laughs> How do you know that? John produces a small date book from his pocket. I've been trying to keep track of the day since the town was evacuated. It was hard to do, but then I found this date book. Oh, you mean? Oh my, look at Caleb accusing me of stealing time. <laughs> look, today is Friday, April 14th. Took me a while to figure that out, but I'm fairly certain it's true. Well, Shabbat Shalom to you then. Shabbat Shalom, Simon. Simon begins the blessing. John joins in, but Caleb does not, and Simon notices. Amen. Simon puts a piece of the horse meat in his mouth, and they watch him as he chews. Well, it's fine. Simon continues chewing. 
and chewing. Uh, you've been chewing that piece of meat longer than the horse was alive. And chewing. Simon continues to chew. Very chewy. Simon finally and with great difficulty swallows. Well? John and Caleb cut into their meat and put a piece to their mouths. They eat in silence. Mm. 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 It is um, chewy. Yes. Mm. All three eat in silence, intensely chewing. Mm. John, you say today is April 14th. It is. <clears throat> you know that puts us at Passover. Imagine that. It can come at a better time. Comes every year this time. You know what I'm talking about. I think he's talking about... I know what he means. The fact that here we are this year, where we are this year, in the middle of all yeah. this year, and Pesach happening at the same time. And why is this year different from all other years? It's a miracle is what it is. Oh, this, Caleb, you weren't ran with us when we said the blessing. So? You forget your Hebrew? No. Nope. So what then? I'm just not big on praying these days, Simon. Since when? Caleb? Since Petersburg. Why? It's not important. I'd like to know. I said it's not important. Yes, but still, I'd like to know. It's because I was at Petersburg, and he, most decidedly, was not. Well, God is not fond of fair weather friends, Caleb. I don't need a sermon, Simon. <laughs> sermon, Simon. <laughs> no, you don't need a sermon, and you ain't gonna get one. Not for me, at least. Thank you. Without you gave up ran. <laughs> it's starting to sound an awful lot like a sermon to me. Uh -uh. It's a simple Simon sermon. <laughs> I just don't understand how you could say you gave up praying just that easy, as if it was an easy thing to do. I'm not asking you to understand. I am asking you to let me eat. But I want to understand, don't you see? You can eat and talk at the same time. God knows you've been doing it all your life. We all pray in this house. Yes, we do. And not just on the high holy days, neither, like some families I could mention. The Solomons. Oh, the Taylors. Yes. Or the Riveras. Uh, to mention just a few. That's enough. For both of you. I don't need to explain anything to either of you. And I don't need a litany of all the underobservant Jews in Richmond. I, I, I stopped praying. I stopped believing. It's as simple as that. That is anything but simple. If you ask, he will provide. You don't think I asked? I did nothing but ask for four years, I asked. At Petersburg, I asked. He was silent. War is not proof of God's absence. It's proof of his absence from men's hearts. And God didn't start this war, Caleb. You did. I did not start this war. I, I, I fought to defend my home. Well, from the looks of things, I'd say you did a... Uh... Pretty lousy job of it. Now start with me on why this war was fought, John. You have no idea. Oh, I think I have an inkling. Why? Well, because you you uh you read about it. Well, no, no, no. no. The, the northern papers, the abolitionist pamphlets. Oh, yes, you read all about it, didn't you? But you don't know. You have no idea what this was. I do. I can tell you about it if you like. I, I've seen quite a bit these last four years. What have you seen? I've, uh, I was at Sharpsburg, Gettysburg, uh, Fredericksburg, and all the places in between and since. Where were you? I've seen plantations of you. Well, I've, I've seen slaves breaking their backs in the fields. And, and, and what have you ever even broken a sweat? And the only cotton you've ever touched is uh, 
resting comfortably on your back right now, so I don't need a lecture from you about what this was. I know better than you do. I know what slavery was. I saw it. I know what war is. I lived it. I don't know. Uh, what, what have you seen? What have you lived? I was starving to death at Petersburg, and you? Oh, well, you, you were... You were safe at home, reading novels. Yes, reading, John, and you have my mother to thank for that. Don't forget. I taught myself how to read. Your mama taught me A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and by the time we got to H, your father put a stop to it. That's because it was against the law. I, I, I wondered if that was the reason, though. I mean, already before she started to teach me, I was asking questions. Like, uh, when was God going to set up? When our lessons ended. But I kept reading. I poured over the books of the Torah, and I kept asking questions, even if it was just for myself. You ever read Leviticus? You know I have. Good. Then you'll remember this. Both thy bondsmen and thy bondsmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about thee. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bond be your possession, and ye shall Take them for your children to inherit for themselves. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, ye shall not rule. You remember reading that? Not enough to memorize it. Yeah, it certainly got me to thinking. Well, I mean, were we Jews or were we slaves? Were we the children of Israel or were we just the heathen that are round about you? Because we couldn't be both. That was clear. And now you say you've given up praying just as easily as that because it was yours to discard if you wanted to it was never ours it was given to us and it could be taken away with just some careful reading of leviticus is your faith that weak john can't answer one question and it all falls apart okay well how do you square it simon i can't i can't square anything i don't understand it ain't ours to square that's why i'm always asking like you asked both of you asked your questions, and sometimes you didn't get answers that you like, but you kept on asking. That's what a Jew is. We talk with God. We wrestle with him. Sometimes we even argue with him, but we never stop asking, looking, hoping for answers. You don't lose your faith by not getting answers. You lose your faith by not asking questions at all. This is who we are. This is our family. This is not my family. Only family you know. Not by choice. Who chooses their family? Whether you like it or not, we are family. Huh. We share the faith. And faith came to us from Caleb's family. A gift. Generations brought up together in this house in the faith of God. That's a family. Okay, and how did that family treat us, Simon? Better than most. Not good enough. You know all the other slaves from around here. You know we had it a world better than they did. Coming after your mama died was the best thing that could have happened to you. You could have been sold to a plantation. You could have been sold to a Christian home. You ever think of that? You think they let you be a Jew in a Christian home? You think they let you be a Jew in any other Jewish home but this? Boy, you don't know how lucky you are to come from this house. You would have had nothing without it. Instead, you sitting here quoting scripture, all on the account of being brought up in this house. You don't know the first thing about this house. Boy, don't you question me on the history of this house. I could write the history of this house. could write your history, too. Yeah, if you could write. Don't need to write to tell your story. You know your story. Yeah, but better than you do. You could put the things you know inside the things you don't and still have room for more. 
You were born in this house. Did you know that? <laughs> I wasn't born in this house. <laughs> you see, already something he don't know and we just getting started. You was born here in this house and then you and your mama were sold to old Mr. Mendez up on the north side of town. That's how you started out. You were six when your mama died. I get that right. I thought so. And Caleb's mama talked Mr. DeLeon into buying your back to have a mother in my Elizabeth and to be near young folks like Caleb and Sarah. I remember the day you came here, grabbing onto a nasty old dirty blanket, scared out of your mind. But you and Caleb got to be like two peas in a pod. Didn't see one where you wouldn't soon see the other. <laughs> Always up in Caleb's room, reading your books, playing out in the yard, picking on my Sarah like the young boys would do, like two peas in a pod. It wasn't a friendship, Simon. Not, not, not when one friend owns the other, orders him around, sends him off for whippings. We ain't talking about whippings. Okay, why not? I mean, we're talking about everything else. Why, if we were a family, did we get whipped like all the other slaves in town? My father only had his slaves whipped when it was absolutely necessary. He abhors the practice. It didn't stop him from practicing it. Sarah was never whipped. Simon was never whipped. Elizabeth was never whipped. So, so why were you? I mean, if we were so unfair, so malevolent, why is it that you were the only one that was whipped and with so much regularity? Elizabeth used to say to Sarah and me, you listen to Mr. DeLeon, do as you told, or they're gonna send you to the whipping men. The whipping men gonna take all the skin off your back. He was like the devil of a whipping man. It's not a whiskey sweating shit like he had in bathing years. Probably had it. He'd pick up the slaves and put them in chains and take them to his shop. There were good stains on the walls. And a large collection of bull whips too. He used them depending on his mood. First time I was sent there, he used a, a pearl-handled bullet. Didn't he, Caleb? Uh, John, you've said enough. Caleb and his father went with me the first time I was sent. Did you know that, Simon? I did. But did, did you know what happened once we got there? John! I mean, Mr. Dalion felt things were getting too chummy around here between me and Caleb, between us and the Dalyons. Felt Caleb didn't fully appreciate the true relationship between a master and his slave. So, off we all went to learn. What happened first, Caleb? You remember? Caleb and his father stood in the corner and watched as the whipping man put me on my knees, didn't you, Caleb? The whipping man took off my shirt. He attached my hands to two leather straps and I was whipped and whipped and whipped, wasn't I, Caleb? And then in the middle of the whippings, I heard Caleb's voice, stop! He yelled, stop! I thought to myself, Caleb is saving me. Caleb is rescuing me. Caleb cares about me. And then I heard Caleb say to his father, I want to do it myself. The whipping man handed Caleb the pearl handled bull whip and Caleb whipped me. Didn't you, Caleb? You whipped me, and whipped me, and whipped me. That's when we stopped being as close as you remember, Simon. John grabs the bottle and exits into the kitchen. Ooh. 
what, uh, what John said. Uh, what I did. Uh, you did what you did. We all did what we did. I threw up after. John doesn't know that, and I, I never went back. John did. My father. He, he, there ain't no reason to go into it no more. No, but I want you to know why I did it. You did it because you could. Simple as that. No, no, no. It, it, it's as it. that. John didn't do himself no favors by being well, by being John. He sassed, he stole, he loafed. Once when you were off at war, your father found out John was running a whole underground book exchange between all the slaves who could read what book there were. Your father found John's hiding place in the cellar, and you know what he did? He sent him to the whipping man. Mm -mm. Made him put them in a wheelbarrow and marched him off to the library. Made him give them all away. Only day in that boy's life I've ever seen him cry. Why didn't he just take them away from him? Because he knew John would just take them right back. And the library is the one place he knew a book would be safe from John's hand. John says my father promised you money when he returns. Is that true? It is. Well, that's good. That's, that's, that's very good. It is good, yes. You think he meant it? One thing I know about your pa, and I know a bit, he say he gonna do something, he gonna do it. Sometimes <laughs> it works out good for you, sometimes it don't. But he will do it. In that case, how do you plan on spending it? We're going to build a house, Elizabeth and me. A house, really? That's, that's nice. Now, very nice, yes. Own something. Be something. And nothing too big. Elizabeth and Sarah have been taking care of this big house for so long. I think a small one to come home to every night might be just right. <laughs> Elizabeth been saving materials for curtain for some time now. God only knows how many windows that woman plans on having. <laughs> and Sarah, well, she wouldn't mind a small room of her own. The lady should have her own room. And you? Me? I'd just be happy seeing them happy. Although, I do think I might like to own a chair. If there's any money left over, a nice, comfortable chair. Could I come visit you? We could probably make a space at the table for you, John, too. Oh, no, I don't think John plans to stay around here too much longer. Where would John go? Oh, he says he's going up to New York. New York? Shoot, that's news to me. I'll believe that when I see it. John talks big, but John acts small. He says he's been planning it ever since it, my father told him about the money. Your father? He never told John nothing. I told John this morning about the money. Any plans he's been making ain't more than a day old. Why would he lie? He is John. Oh. All right, so after you've built your house and bought your chair. If there's any money left over. If there's any money left over, what then? Your father said we could work here still for wages, me, Elizabeth, and Sarah. You'd stay here. Y'all still gonna need a cook, a maid, and well, a Simon. Who else knows this house better than me? No one. <laughs> you got that right. Shoot. Y'all can't afford to do it out as God knows you can. Oh, it's good that you're staying. You'll be like before. No. No, it will not be like before. Now, uh... I know we ain't got all that much around here, despite what John's been bringing in, but I'm going to try to have a Seder tomorrow. A Seder? I was thinking God would forgive us if we're a little late this year, seeing as there's special circumstances and all. So I, I just can't anymore. Oh, then don't. I'm not asking your permission. I'm telling you, I'm going to have a Seder. <laughs> Mr. Seder, in all my years, I'll be damned if I miss it this year. Yeah, we'll send John out to steal a Haggadah. Already got me a Haggadah. You do? 
Can I get from your granddaddy long before you were born? I asked him if Elizabeth and I could have a Seder in the kitchen while they were eating their meal. And the first night of Passover that year, your granddaddy gave me a new Haggadah as a present. Only thing I ever owned in all my life. Can you read it? No, not a word, but I have it. And you don't have anything for the ceremony? I've been thinking about that. I think we can make do. Ain't got no parsley, but there's some celery growing out back. What about bitter herbs? Our collard greens pretty bitter if you eat them raw. What about the wine? Uh, we can just use water. Wish we could make some haroset. Apples hard to come by these days. Huh? Do have eggs though. John stole some this morning. Stolen eggs for your seder. How perfect. None of this is exactly kosher. And a shank bone. Well. We ain't yet had time to bury yours. You're joking. I'm just looking for ideas. <laughs> yeah, well, look elsewhere. <laughs> I got the bones from that old horse. I can use one of those. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, uh, the and the matzah. Already thought of that. You know that hard cracker stuff the soldiers used to carry with them? Made of flour and water and not much else? A hardtack. Uh, that's what it's called, hardtack, yes. I've been choking down hardtack for four years. You want to serve it at a Seder? It's about as unleavened as you can get. Yeah, but where are we going to find hardtack at? Simon reaches his pocket to remove a handkerchief wrapped around a piece of hardtack. Where'd you get that? <laughs> Hospital. Union fellow gave it to me before I left. You could have eaten that. I could have, yes. But then what would we have used for our Zeta? No, this hardtack's special. We'll eat it tomorrow. Yeah, you will. We will. We might. Simon begins gathering up the dishes and silverware. As he does, John re-enters, drunker than before. <laughs> Soldier. <laughs> yeah, that's good, Simon. Clean all that up. <laughs> Simon stops and looks at John. It's a powerful, withering look. It unnerves John, while the brio disappears for as long as Simon remains on stage. Simon slowly exits to the kitchen. <laughs> We're having to say it tomorrow. <laughs> Seems that way. It seems right. It seems right and good that we do. Let's just celebrate freeing other slaves out of Egypt, out of Richmond, maybe out of kind of rabbi. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's a sensible idea. You think? Yeah, you'll have quite the congregation. All the Jewish Negroes in Virginia. Yeah, I think I'll have enough for a minion. Oh, I could go to college up north. I could go to Harvard. Oh, you couldn't get into Harvard. And I probably shouldn't go then. <laughs> mm. Ooh, maybe I'll write a book, like uh, Frederick Douglass. Maybe you will. <laughs> or maybe I'll even put you in it, Caleb Legree. <laughs> oh, you are enjoying this, aren't you? <laughs> what? Settling scores. Oh, is that what I'm doing? I don't know what you're doing. Why are you here, John? I'm waiting for my money. <laughs> the money my father told you he'd give you? Mm -hmm. That's right. Simon just told me that my father never said that to you. Did he? <laughs> you only found out about it this morning when Simon told you. Oh. So you lied to me. Oh, so what if I did? <laughs> I'm still here waiting for it, aren't I? But why did you come back here in, in the first place? See, I know why you're staying. I just don't understand why you came back. I live here. No, you don't. No, not anymore. You're, uh, you're, you're free, remember? And what makes you think you're going to see any of that money? It seems like if my father meant to tell you about it, he would have. So why are you here, John? It's not for the money, and it's certainly not to reminisce. Where are the other Confederate soldiers? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> why are you here and no one else is? 
I mean, why are you sneaking home in the middle of the night, riding a dead horse, and there are no other Rebs to be found? Why is Freddie Cole looking for you? Did he do that to your hand? No, I cut it. On what? A piece of glass. Breaking into a home? Maybe. Well, maybe you should have Simon take a look at it. And maybe you should worry about your own wounds. Mm, well, maybe the people who you robbed would like to know what you've been up to. Oh, if you could find them. <laughs> They'll be back eventually. Yeah, I'll be gone by then. All right, well, then maybe my father would like to know what you've been up to. And maybe you'd like to know what he's been up to. You know something you're not telling me? Let me see your pardon. My pardon? Your pardon? Officers and soldiers at Appomattox were paroled. If you were there, like you said, you'd have a pardon. A piece of paper, something. I, uh... Where is it? It's hidden. Where? I'm not telling you. Uh, show it to me. No. Why not? Because it's mine. You know I know what I think? I don't care what you think. I think you weren't anywhere near Appomattox. I think you surrendered long before the rest of your army did. I think you're a deserter. Well, you can think whatever you like. I bet I can prove it, too. <laughs> it's why you didn't want to go to the hospital, isn't it? I mean, you go there, someone's going to figure out your story. So you have your surgery here. Have Simon care for your wounds, get your food. Oh, and of course, hide you in case anybody comes around here looking for you. Does the that about sum it up? Well, you you certainly are the expert on having Simon hide you from people who are looking for you, aren't you, John? And besides, even if what you're saying were true, what difference does it make now? War is over and I lost. And you weren't there when it happened. Uh, well, what about the men you abandoned? The men you were responsible for leading, Captain Delion. Uh, deserting the army is one thing, but you deserted your men. They are hanging from the nearest branch the second they find you. I'm home now! Uh, and even if, even if they came here looking for me, mm -hmm. Simon wouldn't give me up. What if Simon wasn't here? Where would he go? Let's say he goes out looking for a Sarah and Elizabeth. Why would he do that? They're, they're with my father. <laughs> what? John! Tell me, goddammit! They're gone. They're with my father. No, they are not. They are gone. Gone where? Sold. <laughs> You're lying. Mm-mm. It was gone. Shotgun was gone and he sold me. No. No, that's not possible. Of course it is. He owned it. could sell them if he wanted to. Well, he wouldn't have. Why not? Because... It, uh, because it, we're a family. No. No. That's not possible. Not Sarah. Not Elizabeth. No. I saw it with my own eyes. Watch them taken out in chains. Caleb, they're gone. Why would he do that? Caleb. You, 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 can't, you can't think of a reason, Caleb, why your father might not want Sarah around the house anymore. Did you tell my father? No. Did you tell my father? I didn't have to. When was the last time you were home on leave? I don't remember. September, seven months ago. Um, what? A parent in that time. What, 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 are you, what are you saying? You know what I'm saying. 
Sarah is. Sarah is. Oh. God, Sarah. She must have been so scared. God, God, this is my fault. This is all my fault. Sarah, my Sarah. Your Sarah. God, why did he do it? He's a prominent man and people do talk. Well, uh, who, who, who bought them? A traitor headed west away from the Federals. He must have known the war was coming to an end. Didn't sell them for much. You, you have known this whole time. You said nothing. What do I owe you? What do you owe Simon? We have to tell him. He, uh, he has to know. Simon! Simon, get in here! Really, the second you tell him. Well, he has to know. And then you're here alone and helpless. Well, you, you, you would... Or uh, what, well, I, I what? You would leave me here like this. Oh, I would leave you much worse. Well, then what are we going to do? We, we are not doing anything. We're not saying anything. But Sarah... Now, Simon, he will leave. And when Simon leaves, I leave that, I promise you. And you will die. I mean, can you feed yourself? Clean your wound? Hide from any soldiers who might be out there looking for you. Can you do that? We wait like we have been. We let your father tell Simon when he gets home. If he gets home. But they'll, they'll be long gone by then. They're long gone already. Simon enters. Caleb, you want something? Oh, uh, no, it's uh, uh, nothing. Nothing, Simon. I'm, I'm sorry. Lights out. End of Act One. Act two, scene one. Caleb stands on both feet facing us. My dearest Sarah, this is my 25th letter to you. I fear it will be my last. I do not know what the next few days will bring, but the indications are not encouraging. I have only a few moments and a few pieces of paper to write down all my thoughts. I am, as I have been for the past 210 days, stationed in a trench outside Petersburg, up to my waist in a putrid mixture of water, excrement, and blood. I am frozen. I am hungry. I am achingly weary. I woke this morning. Uh, to a corpse staring at me. He was alive when I fell asleep and this morning he's blue and lifeless. No one yet has had the strength to remove him. And they'll do that here. Leave a body in place until the rats discover him and only then will they move him to where the other bodies are stacked up. There is no burial in a trench. We're already buried. My men pray daily to God, and daily he ignores their prayers. 
but all my Sarah, despite all this, I, I can still cast my mind back to my last night at home, to the, to the last time we were together and the hours we spent well in the night to fight back the day. How gentle you were with me then, despite the roughness the war has caused in me. How easily you smoothed out all my coarseness. How great the calm was that came over me when I was with you. You are home to me. You are warm. Well, I granted one wish, it would be to grow great wings and fly far from this place. And fly over these battlefields, this scarred earth over armies and governments and wars and cannons until I was back home with you and books and fires and, and silence. But daily, these thoughts that move further and further from me, they, they recede from my vision, from my grasp, from my mind. These letters are the only things I have that keep them from disappearing altogether. I want, I want to place them in your hands and, and, and watch as you read the words of love I have written only for you. I want your eyes to fall upon them and know their meaning. Know my meaning. Know me. Know me. Know me. I remain now and forever. Yours. Lights fade. End of scene one. Scene two. The next evening, Saturday, April 15th, 1865. The room is now filled with even more possessions from the neighboring homes. Chandelier, rolls of carpets, paintings and furniture and stacks of silverware. The book collection has grown considerably. There are also more candles about, some in lamps, others bare. John enters in his finest outfit yet, holding Caleb's packet of letters reading aloud from the one we just heard. I want your eyes to fall upon them and know their meaning. Know my meaning. Know me, know me, know me. <laughs> the sound of his voice stirs Caleb awake. He catches the end of it slowly at first to register that it's his letter John's reading. Pretty flowery stuff, Caleb. Hey, you give that to me. Well, come and take it. You had no right to go through my things. No, I didn't, and yet. Give them to me, God damn it! they're not yours. They're not yours either. These are Sarah's. Those are personal and private. My dearest Sarah, I... Ooh. John! Caleb starts to get up, but the pain in his leg is bad, and he screams he's not going anywhere. He falls back and fights the tears that are welling up inside him. These are not tears of pain, much deeper than that. Fights them off and lays there panting and defeated. How long are we going to lie to him? That depends on you, I guess. They're out there, John. Elizabeth and Sarah with my child. He has to know. Then tell him. And let him go find them. I mean, I'll gladly take you to the hospital. You know, why don't we just grab your pardon and then we'll go. <laughs> now, if you don't mind, I have a Seder to prepare. You want a book to read? I want my letters back. Please. John looks them over and then tosses them to Caleb. Caleb flips through them to make sure they're all there and John continues setting up. So noise outside and John and Caleb both freeze. Caleb reaches for something to use as a weapon and tosses it to John who slowly approaches the door, wielding it. A tense moment, who is it? The door opens, it is Simon. John instantly relaxes, he and Simon just stare at each other a moment. Oh, evening. Um. I, I set up the Seder like you asked. <laughs> I see that. Thank you. It's almost dark. We should probably start soon. Yes. 
well, oh, you just gonna stand there or come on in? <laughs> the president's dead. What? Which? President Lincoln. He's dead. How? Shot. Last night at a theater. He's gone. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't heard it with my own ears. Right there in the middle of the market, a fellow rides up and just says it, announces it like he's called on a dance. Folks started cheering, whooping, dancing. Now it started going crazy, crazier than it's been the last few weeks even. All them folks were so happy. White folks anyway. It's crazy out there now. The Federals are all over the place. More coming in all the time. They think he come to Richmond, the one who did it. They blocking the roads and all the ins and outs. No one's going nowhere till they find him. And Father Abraham is gone. I met him just the other day when he coming to Richmond. You met Abraham Lincoln? Oh. He was a sight to see. Just as tall as they said. Tall. He wore a hat that stretched up to the sky. Made him all that much taller. <laughs> but when he walked, his shoulders was rounded and he slouched a bit like he was scared of being up so high. It didn't matter though. That man had height to spare. He looked to be 200 years old. His eyes were sunk down in his face and his wrinkles was deeper than any I've ever seen on a man. Like someone took a knife and carved them in. He had a whole crowd of folks around him colored folks, well, they followed him and touched him and kissed his hand. No one had to tell me who he was. Even if I hadn't seen his picture before, I still would have known. The proudest day of my life. He was coming towards where I was standing. I walked to him and I stopped right in front of him. And he stopped. And we looked at each other. What'd you do? I bowed. You bowed? Only thing I could think to do. What did he do? He bowed back. Only thing he could think to do, I guess. It was a great man. Abraham. Father Abraham who set us free. There's your Moses, John. <laughs> what are you blubbering about over there? I'm, I'm sorry. 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 Uh, about what? I'm so, I'm so sorry. It's okay then. It's okay. Ain't your fault, Caleb. Ain't your fault. There's mad men in this world. That ain't your fault. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Calm yourself. Calm yourself. Wash it all away like this rain here. Wash it all away and start all over. There. That's better. I'm going to get you some water. John, why don't you finish setting up? Then we'll be ready to start. Okay, okay Simon. <laughs> Careful, Caleb. You have to tell him. Go on and tell him then. Open his eyes and open your own. Richard, we can hear what he said. The town is crawling with federal soldiers now because of Lincoln. Don't be brought to them without a pardon in your hands. Roadblock in and out of town. There's nowhere to go, Caleb. You best make do with what you got here. 
John. We need to... We need to get started. <laughs> Simon. Oh, take this down, read along in case I forget. I'm going to be jumping around a bit. Just make sure I stay on the track. <laughs> oh, you forgot something, Simon. What's that? Tom produces a bottle of wine from his sack. You discover that too. Nah, Simon. This I stole. <laughs> it's already open. Well, I'd have found out if it was any good. <laughs> Fine then. <laughs> was hoping to find an apple for Horose, something to stand in for mortar. Couldn't find anything, but I got this will do. He pulls out a brick from his sack. Can't eat it, but it means the same. He sets the brick down on the Seder plate, setting it with a clunk. Well, let's start. Caleb? Yeah? You gonna do this with us? You'll let me. All are welcome. Good, good. Simon moves to the place setting and sits. John takes the wine and pours a small amount into each of the three glasses, then fills Caleb's now empty mason jar. All right, then. Simon holds up his glass. Caleb and John follow suit. Behold this, our first, the first of our four cups of wine. Let it be a symbol of our joy tonight as we celebrate the festival of Pesach. He sets the wine down. Praise be you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Praise be you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commandments. Well done, Simon. <laughs> Not bad for an old man, huh? Not bad at all. <laughs> I have no idea what comes next. Uh, as a token of your love. Yeah, 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 yes. As a token of your love, O Lord, our God, you have given us occasions for rejoicing festivals and holidays for happiness, this feast of unleavened bread, the season of our liberation from bondage in Egypt. Praise be you, Lord, who sanctifies the people of Israel and the festival seasons. Praise be you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has kept us in life and sustained us and enabled us to reach this day. If only by the skin of our teeth. Amen. <laughs> That's right. Caleb and John drink their wine, but then notice Simon has not done the same. You're supposed to drink, Simon. I know. Do you drink? Not a drop in all my life. Simon brings the glass to his lips. He lets the wine slide down his throat. It tastes like freedom. He closes his eyes. When Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people go, oppressed so hard they could not stand. Let my people go, go down. Moses, way down in Egypt's land, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Simon takes the celery off the plate and hands them to John and Caleb, keeping one for himself. They dip it in salt water. Praise be you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the earth. They eat the celery. Caleb, break the hardtack now and read some. Caleb picks up the middle piece of hardtack and breaks it in two. John hands him the Haggadah. As Caleb reads, Simon leans back, great satisfaction on his face. He continues to hum. Mm -hmm. oh. Behold the matzah, the 
spread of poverty, which our ancestors... Whose ancestors? Our ancestors. Yes, sir! Oh. Which our ancestors ate in their affliction when they were slaves in the land of Egypt. Let... Let all who are hungry come and eat! Let all who are in need come celebrate Pesach! This year we are slaves! Next year may we be free! Next year we will be free! Jello! Pharaoh! Let my people go! Manistana! Ala leheze miko hale lo. You can't ask the question, Simon. That's my job. I'm the youngest. I should be the one to ask. I'll ask. I want to see if you have any answers for me. A child has questions. A man has answers. On all other nights, we eat either leaven or unleavened bread. Why on this night are we eating this hard tag, Caleb? Because our ancestors left Egypt in such a hurry, there was no time for the dough to rise. The first Seder was improvised, like ours. Imagine that. John, on all of the nights, we eat all kinds of herbs. Why on this night do we eat only bitter herbs? To remind us of the bitterness of slavery. As if we needed reminding. Your children will, and their children will. We must not forget. Your children must be taught. Yours too, Caleb. On all of the nights, we do not dip any food in any other even once. Why on this night do we dip twice the celery and the salt water? To remind us of the tears of slavery. And if we had any heroes set? To remind us that sweetness can come from bitterness. On all of the nights, we eat sitting up at the table. Why on this night do we recline? Because reclining, because rest is the symbol of a free man. Ah, go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land. Oh, tonight we celebrate the dream and the hope of freedom. The dream and the hope that has filled the hearts of men from the time our Israelite ancestors went forth out of Egypt. Oh, hello. Harold, oh, let my people go. Oh, people have suffered and sacrificed to make this dream come true. Father Abraham sacrificed. He sacrificed all he had. Father Abraham, our American Moses, led us from toil and bondage, but was not allowed to enter the promised land. Father Abraham, Father Abraham, Father Abraham. Wait! As I saw, Father Abraham gave his life to the struggle for freedom. Now we must dedicate ours. Though the sacrifice be great and the hardships many, we won't rest until the chains that enslave all men be broken. Broken. Uh, who let my people go? Because being free means more than broken chains. You know that, right? It means freedom from anything that breaks your spirit or muddles your mind because there's more than just one way a man can be a slave. How else? Come on now. How about all that drinking you've been doing, John? What about it? I know it muddles your mind. You are a slave to the bottle. How about you, Caleb? I, I, I don't know, Simon. Oh, you do. I don't How think I do. Yeah. You forever branded just like a slave. You're a slave to your old ideas. Oh, how deeply those enslavements have scarred the world, the wars. Yes. The destruction. Yes. The suffering, the waste. Oh my God, the waste. Hey, stop calls us to be what? Free. Ah, hey, stop calls us to freedom. 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 Ha <laughs> ha, let freedom ring in this house. Yes, sir. Let freedom ring in the city. Let freedom ring in this nation. Oh, 
Sing it with me. Go down. Moses, way down in Egypt's land, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Okay, good. Let's get back to reading. Caleb, read. Uh, um. Once we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord our God brought us forth with a strong hand and <clears throat> and, and an outstretched arm. If, if God had not brought our ancestors out of Egypt, we and our children and, and our children's children might still be enslaved. sold them. What? He sold them. Oh? Ooh! Sarah and Elizabeth. Expecting. Expecting? Yes. You what? Where'd they go? I, I, I don't know. Uh, Where'd they go? I don't know. I promise you. Who bought them? them? Who um, bought the them? You think I'm playing around? Oh, God, John, tell him. John. You knew about this! Simon, uh... You knew about this! Simon grabs the brick and pins John against the wall, shaking him as he speaks, the brick hovering perilously close to John's face. Three days. Three days you knew there was salt, and you said nothing! You said nothing! Three days uh, you knew about my family! You said nothing! Women! Where'd it go? Who has them? I don't know. Why'd you keep it from me? I mean, I... What happened? With the day Richmond fell, Mr. DeLeon sold Elizabeth and Sarah. Oh, God! I tried to stop him. He sent me to the whipping man, and, 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 and in the middle of the whipping, the, 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 the leather strap, the... Oh, what about it? It was old. He rid of it, just snapped, snapped off, and I... I I grabbed the whip from him as he was coming to me right out of the air stomach and I snatched it from him. I don't know why I did it. And? Uh, 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 I whipped him. God. Uh, like you whipped me. God. He was on the ground and I took the hand of the... Oh, I knew he used on me, and I beat him with him. John! I beat him, and beat him, and beat him! And I killed him. I killed the whipping man, Simon. I killed him. John, John, John! Freddy, Freddy walked in. Freddy saw me. I ran, and he saw Freddy. Oh. You're a dead man, you know that? I'm scared. Scared. Uh, that's scared. That's why you're doing all this. Because you can't leave, can you? And what have you been doing all this time, huh? Caleb here, the only reason he's so afraid to go to the hospital. I don't need no explanations from you. 
dull and deceitful peas in a pod? I was scared, Sam, and I had no choice. No! You're free now. For the first time in your life, you do have a choice. You had a choice, and you made a choice. When you were beat man to death, you made a choice. When you hit from pretty cold, you made a choice. When you lied to me about my family, you made a choice. I see the choices you made. They tell me all I need to know about the man you are, about the free man you gonna be. You don't get to be free. You work to be free. It's what we've been praying for tonight, what you should have learned from all your reading. Were we Jews or were we slaves? I know what you are. You ain't no Jew. You ain't even a man. Just a nigger, John. Nigger, 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 John. <laughs> Sorry, I... So, you know. What good your side's gonna do me? Your side's gonna bring back my family? No, no. Then keep them. I don't need them. You think I didn't know Caleb what you were doing with my daughter? Uh, you think I'm stupid? I don't have eyes. I loved her. <laughs> You own her! You loved her. How'd you love her, Caleb? You love her like you love a dog? You love a dog? You feed a dog. But when he acts up, you also a dog. You might have thought you loved Sarah, but you also own her. And if this happened, all this happened, you would have owned your own baby too. You would have owned your own child, Caleb. No, that's not how it was. Oh, you don't know how it was. You don't know what this was. You don't have any idea. Simon takes off his shirt to reveal a horrible patchwork of scars on his back from various whippings throughout his life. You see this? From the whipping man. Your father sent me, and your grandfather too. I got your family tree right here on my back. You see? This is what this was. This is your legacy. This is your family's legacy. Simon. I'm going off to find my family, my wife, my daughter, my grandchild. Lost to the path. You know where they might be. Wait, wait, Simon, it's, it's dark. Yes, it is, but I will be going. The roadblocks. Oh, let them try and stop me. Simon, wait. What? Take me with you, please. Take yourself. Okay. How's that my problem? Freddy's after me. You gotta solve this on your own, boy. You can't stay here. Then leave. I can't leave. And then stay. I can't, Simon, please. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. Huh. You free now. <laughs> but what am I supposed to do? Look like you two need each other. Both of you need help from each other. I won't help him. Well, that's your choice, ain't it? Help him. Don't help him. Stay here, don't stay. Ain't my problem no more. Two peas in a pod. Simon. Simon takes his haggadah. I wouldn't feel too badly if I were you, Caleb. You ain't the only man in your family to have a baby with a slave. I think it's time you knew that fact. Things don't change that much from father to son. That much I can see. Or I guess from brother 
to brother. That much I can see now, too. Simon slowly begins exiting. When the Lord returns the exiles of Zion, we will have been like dreamers. <laughs> then our mouths will be filled with laughter and our tongues with a joyous song. <laughs> Then will they say among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. Diamond. <laughs> Next year in freedom, Next year in Jerusalem, Simon exits. John walks to the open door and stands there, watching Simon leave. He charges back into the house and grabs the sack and starts filling it with some of the stolen goods. He heads for the door, but stops as he reaches it. He wants to leave, but he can't. John throws the sack to the ground and stalks around the room for a moment, finally grabbing a whiskey bottle and sitting down to take a drink. After a long moment, he offers the bottle to Caleb. He takes the bottle and drinks, and then hands the bottle back to John. They pass the bottle between themselves, looking through the open door at the world outside. The rain continues. The lights slowly fade on them.